Welcome. Thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a portfolio analyst with Tricom. Tricom is pleased to introduce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of this series is to share expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. The presenter today is Greg Blackwell from Great Performance Coaching. In Greg's 30 years of experience in the sales field, he learned what it takes to succeed. He's been a quota-busting top performer in sales and management, receiving public recognition for his achievements. The ability is to identify the root obstacle holding you back, then give you the strategies and skills you need to get superior results. He's hundreds of sales pros into top performers. His true passion has always been to make a difference in the lives of others, helping sales professionals lead happier and more productive lives. And sales experience led Greg to launch Great Performance Co Coaching to help achieve their potential. Greg teaches his clients how to become great performers by using street tested processes and skills that are efficient, effective, and enjoyable. Coaching provides and tap workshops, keynote speeches, and insightful executive coaching services to lead companies to give them an edge. Greg gives people strategies, tactics, and execution so they get better results faster. This industry insider webinar, we will cover part two of the three biggest mistakes in selling staffing services. At the end of the session, you'll be able to strengthen relationships and increase sales in existing accounts as become the staffing business partner of choice for your ideal prospects. If you have any questions during the presentation, Please utilize the chat feature located on the right toolbar and questions to all panelists. In the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us our feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Turn the floor over to Greg. And, and welcome to everyone. Happy Memorial Day week. I hope you had a good weekend. To do is to first a brief review of what we covered last time in the August of 2012 webinar and find part of today's topic interesting, but I don't go into a lot of detail. It's because it's on that August 2012 webinar, which you can find on the Tricom website. So let's start it. What we're about today is the big three mistakes that people make I want to focus on mistake number two, having to do with the sales process. And then the topic, we're going to go deep in strategic questioning funnel that you can use to get out in front of RFPs as well as elicit more information with less work from the people you talk to. Myth number one, difference with Haley Martin marketing white paper on this. It's really good. You should uh, put it and read it. In essence, if you differentiate yourself as we have great service, well, think about this. What if the 10 supply call on you and ask them to differentiate themselves? They're likely to give you some version of, well, we have great service. Well, how do you feel after hearing that several times? A bit skeptical? Might become cynical. So, uh, yeah, service business, but people try to differentiate on service. So, if you differentiate in a memorable way, it's to have to be on something else. And those suggestions in uh, David's white paper on that about how you can go deeper or you bring in Haley Marketing, if you wish, as a partner. Two, has to do with the sales process. Versus selling an insight based solution, probably a mistake. Our business review put out a, a white paper last year on insight selling. Now, there's a company named Challenger that went really deep with it, and we admire their bravado, I don't agree with their approach. It's quite provocative. It's not for everyone. But some great points. They say that social selling is dead. I don't agree. And that insight selling is the new holy grail of how to sell more. 
I do agree with the premise that insight selling is important. Talk more about that. A real corporate executive board study of more than 1,400 business-to-business customers they found that they completed 60% of their purchasing decision. Things researching solutions were options. Think the requirements, benchmark pricing, and so on, before even having a conversation with a supplier. The upgraded solution sales rep had become more of an annoyance than an asset. Customers are often much ahead of the salespeople trying to help them in selling. Reps were asking generic questions to uncover a need that they've solved for another client, just like that one, and then propose their solution. It's not a bad approach. It still works today, but only large, well-established firms that have a clear understanding of their needs and hence immediately shot for the best price. Does that sound bigger? In selling requires research and analysis. Spotting trends to help prospects with potential problems that lie ahead it requires the rep to capitalize on their experience. Bring valuable data and insights to the table to credentialize themselves today and encourage the customer to think differently. Here's an example uh, a boutique staffing firm. We're based in Atlanta. One of the trends that we discovered is that retiring boomers with critical skills and knowledge leaving the workforce and companies were encouraging them to retire because of rising benefit costs. We went and showed one employer how to streamline the onboarding process for the placements and lower expense. We started with one office and handle the entire country for this company. In addition to thinking differently and showing demographic trends, you uh, have to also follow a process. If you remember the book, Good to Great, Ben Collins, one of the great things he said in there, the mark of mediocrity is a marginal product. It's consistent. And a customer experience needs to be consistent for an individual sales route, but by the entire field force of that firm. Build those kinds of capabilities. Go out and build it yourself. You buy it. You can rent it. Or you could do a joint venture alliance with another firm who's already mastered it. Another thing it's part of this process is the reality of management where the force is managed, not coached. Now, management's important. We have to establish clear direction. We have to have motivation. Clear is where you get the extra return on investment. Here's the difference. Managing your clear observations people in you're sharing your perceptions and you're exploring options you then come to the conclusion therefore their own epiphany that's the trick to lasting change if you use carrot and the stick your people become either weary of the stick or offer bigger and bigger carrots to keep good sales talent around in the long run is you've got to create a happy work environment for them. We found that coaching them, allowing them to be part of the solution is key ingredient to keeping happy, productive employees. So you're directing and you decide. In coaching, you're facilitating a thought process. They decide on the results. And then you use authority and you get short-term change. But in rating, you get lasting behavioral change. Now it's the what and the how. But it changing. They're open to a variety of how. When we're hard on the issue, 
but we're easy on the person. Number three, his sales force has undeveloped personal skills. And crucial skills that I coach on. Tult gravitas, which is an executive presence that commands respect. You met people like that. Second is connecting with others or quickly establishing a bond or a relationship. Third one is the skill of questioning. We're going to go deeper on that in today's workshop. But it's the skill of eliciting information in a conversational and customer-focused way, not an interrogation. The skill is active listening or listening. In other words, you want to understand what they meant, not what they said. The skill of hitching or positioning is the skill of linking your solution to their expressed needs in a compelling way. It's a way of leveraging the answers to their questions from your listening and position how your solution satisfies their stated needs in their language. The signal is verifying or checking. You're checking for feedback. The difference between questioning and checking or verifying. Questioning, you're eliciting information. Verifying, you're eliciting feedback. When one clients are tired of being closed, they don't want to put in a headlock and give it a noogie to buy something. So the sort of verifying gets you a higher win rate by buying throughout every conversation. It starts in the opening dialogue when you first sit down. Then I'll go deeper on the sales process, the focus of today's call. There's only a flow that should occur throughout the entire sales call, and it should be consistent from call to call. Your questions will vary depending upon your target audience. But the flow is the same. Let's talk about the opening. The opening a, a personal or professional report. The most mundane way we do it is how is your commute into work or how is the weather where you are if you're on the phone. You can go deeper than that if you have notes on your prospect in your CM. Then you position your agenda for the meeting, including the bits of the customer of actually engaging in the dialogue. Stop and ask a checking question. Does this mean needs? What would you like for me to emphasize or de-emphasize? What do you add or change to today's agenda? You don't have a time check. Hey, we set aside an hour for today's call. Does that still work for your schedule? And you would then offer a relevant insight. It can be your research of industry trends, chain competitive landscape, or responses to the current economic environment. You can simply position an insight into how other customers like them are addressing the issue or trend that's affecting that customer. What are your thoughts on that? The coin funnel. I'm going to deeper on this in a moment in minute detail. If you don't have it out, I encourage you to have a pencil or a pen and paper handy. In the workshop, I received a lot of requests for the speaker's notes, and I'm sorry, but I don't send those out. So you want to take notes on the questions that you hear that resonate with you or that you find effective. But in three general areas of this questioning funnel, a strategic context, the opportunities, and then the decision criteria being used. In the strategic context, first, your vision question, where you understand the long-term qualitative goal that the organization wants to achieve. Typically, these kinds of goals, they take more than a year to achieve. Um, for example, I'd say, well, we'll have the industry reputation as the, the company Customers love to work with. In the vision, fine. What you might say with the C executive who shared that with you, ask a question like, hey, 
your achievements are impressive. Long-term vision guiding that success. Another you could ask. I would even recommend you ask them in this order. The question is the business objectives in order to achieve that, that vision. The short-term or less than a year quantitative objectives necessary in order to achieve the vision. All a number of high-level objectives contribute to achieving the overall vision. A questionnaire might be something like, what's you taking in order to achieve that vision? Or, how are you measuring progress? Question I would ask in talking to a C-level executive would be challenging issues that should be removed. You'll find the obstacles that the customer is experiencing trying to reach those objectives. These issues are, are what stakeholders focus on and what they worry about. I found four types of issues. It can be the competition. Second, market issues. Third, financial issues. Or four, operational issues. An example of a good question you might ask here would be, this is hindering your team's ability to meet the important objectives that you've uncovered in question number two. Initiatives then need to be discovered that are challenging issues. You'll explore the customer organization's high-level response to every challenging issue they share with you. Usually, these strategic initiatives are currently underway or they're planned for the near future may be under consideration by management and might be confidential at this time. These initiatives can become potential opportunities for you. Critical success factors. Well, let me go back and give you an example. For strategic initiative, what the might sound like is how has your company or your team responded to the challenges that you heard in question number three? So number three was, what's hindering your team's ability to meet these important objectives? Five, and how has your company responded to these challenges? This question, how do with the critical success factors for each initiative? So strategic initiative, discuss a few things that the customer absolutely must have in place so that you can contribute to the success of the initiative. I'd ask here might be, well, what's important to ensuring the success of the initiative I just shared with you? Strategic level, those are five different questions you might ask at the C level that will help you drill down in the way they think long-term impact on the business at strategic level. Start at the middle of the funnel. Talk of the opportunity. Sometimes mid-sized firms and certainly with smaller firms, you'll start at the strategic level and go straight on into the opportunity level. If you have larger firms, complex firms, you would the strategic context questions with C-level executives, let them uh, review to someone else in the organization, another stakeholder, a line of business head, and you start into the opportunity questions at that level. Some of the types of questions in the opportunity section of the questioning funnel. The first question might be the current situation. You're trying to uncover the customer's current situation or their operation and processes. You want to remember where the customer is today with regard to the challenging issues and the strategic initiatives that led you to identify the opportunity for you. What it might sound like is what you're doing with regard to and whatever initiative or uh, strategic initiative that the level executive, the C-level executive, it shared with you earlier. What are you doing with regard to an initiative? The question you would ask 
do with the, would have to do with the less satisfaction. In other words, you understand what's working and what needs to be changed. What that's like is, hey, may I ask, how is that working? And what do you do differently? It has to do with the desired situation, the ideal, or what the customer envisions is the ideal solution or outcome. The question is pretty straightforward. What does this ideal solution look like to you? Many sales reps, they go in there trying so hard to be clever and witty and thought provoking and, and, and impress the customer with how smart they are. But they found what is a small business owner or a C level executive is the clip questions that you ask. Your research in pairing for their view in the first place. They know whether or not you understand their business, their personal challenges, or the kinds of questions that you ask. Also, you don't have to hand them on a silver platter the ideal solution. Many times they have a pretty good idea of what it looks like. They help in polishing it, making it real, bold. Given that you call other firms like them in a similar situation, you had the validation they're looking for that it's field tested and it'll work. So I have the question, what does the ideal solution look like to you? Compared events. This is asking about what's having the organization to be interested in this type of solution at this point in time. In other words, the business logic that makes us important to management now. That question you might help me end. Why is now the time to solve this issue? Now, moving forward, if they have any sense of urgency or a deadline around it, that's a big red flag. A lot of sales reps wasting a lot of company resources in their own time thinking they're pursuing a real opportunity when management themselves has no sense of urgency around it. How can I get them to have a sense of urgency? You know what my is? You can't. It's not a hurt level priority for management. Instead of trying to get them to see what lies ahead, they can get where they are without being pretty smart. So I'll trust their judgment as to what their priorities are. They don't see this as an urgency. Um, shut off your sandals. Make a man stand. Uh, they need to be coy, Roy. You know the rest of that song. This level of questions has to do with the personal needs. You want to get about their personal motivations and their goals linked to the success of an initial an initiative uh, or a the solution here would be important to you, and you put emphasis on you. The magic that it takes to close the sale. If you act with intellectual list thinking to close sale, you've missed the boat. I think on this call, no, from the 1980s study. People make emotional decisions and then gin up intellectual rationalizations. Well, this is one of the most powerful questions deep down in the funnel that helps close the sale when the time is right. It matters to them personally. So that's the middle of the funnel. Well, the bottom section of the funnel, the decision-making criteria. The first might be, let's see, Get my pointer. Here we go. The company. You will identify two different forms of competition. One be an outside provider, but the other might well be internal projects that are competing for management's attention and budget dollars right now. So what questions might sound like is first would be who else are you considering to help with this initiative? Second, for internal projects that are competing 
meeting. The best thing I've heard. It's like this. Are competing for leadership's attention. It's like this. Are competing for leadership's attention. Again, the decision process has to do with authority. Now, in authority, I want to get the details on the decision-making process, stakeholders, the power structure, the constraints. Let's take each of those separately. The process, here's a question. Milestones in the decision-making process. Let you. What key milestones in the decision-making process? Let's see, under authority, stakeholders. I love this wording. Yourself, who in the decision making process? So, this is usually person making all the decisions. A committee. The larger the firm, the more the collaboration is required. But you identify up front who are the stakeholders. Relationships. The question is what it might sound like. Understand how these stakeholders fit into your organization and in the decision process. I mean, who works to whom? Under the third, the fourth area, the power structure. You to find out the real power structure in an organization it would be this. Hey, into the time, who make the final decision? Under the fifth area of questioning has to do with the selection criteria. You might ask, when stakeholders think about the decision before them, what factors are most important to the group? The sixth area under authority has to do with the constraints. Times, if you're walking in, and you, many times you are, especially on the larger cases, there's an interesting contract in place. You want to be careful not to spin your wheels. So the question would sound like, what actual constraints exist with the current provider to play the decision? What actual constraints exist with the current provider that might play the decision? So those six different areas under authority that you would explore. Let's talk about budget. You want to doubt if a specific budget has been set aside, and if so, how much? It's a question. Resources have been allocated to this initiative. What's your budget? It's a little different to some people's taste. Why don't you address it up? You could ask, hey, what budget in place to address this challenging issue? I resources better personally. What resources have been allocated to this initiative? The next area under division making is trust. You have questions to determine how familiar the stakeholders are with your firm and how they feel about your capabilities. One client, they are dealing with one existing customer for seven years and never once asked them this question. When they did, the answers were shocking. The customer was totally transparent about what they liked and what didn't like about their current relationship. From my customer learned, his relationship was at risk. There were things this client was unhappy about. Well, they've taken this customer for granted for years. They asked, they said, you know what, we've been working together for seven years, and I've never asked you this, but your impression of our firm? And the current just gushed with what I liked and what I really didn't like. My client 
client a chance to change and make adjustments in order to obtain and sustain that relationship. Now, bottom line here is, after you go through the questioning funnel, you're trying to figure out, is this opportunity worth pursuing before you get more time and resources to it? But with that, a little deeper with some enrichment questions. There are three types. The action question. We're asking for the customer's point of view or opinion on a specific topic. Enrichment questions are not a linear progression the ones I just covered on the questioning funnel. These are on the side that you pull out of your hat when needed during the conversation. Now, this is an art, not a science. When I went to a client um, interview, I've got my questions lined up in advance, typed in a minute that I'll pull from. I have no embarrassment about showing them my dial model that I'm going to go through or the questions that I'm working from. And look at my piece of paper and, hey, Greg, what is that? I'll say, this thing I brought in order to make the best use of your time today. I don't know if it's my cheat sheet, but I don't see them anymore to be smart enough enough to remember everything I want to remember in an interview. A discovery interview, an exploratory interview. So, in written questions, there are three types, and I'll give you examples of each. In question, your customer's point of view or their opinion on a specific topic. And you might ask this, what did you think about that? When will ends like that become worrisome for you? Or who would be most impacted if that legislation passes? The same questions. The type of enrichment question is a relevance question. There, you're asking the customer to reflect on and discuss the relevance of the insight that you just provided to his situation. What that's like. You might say, to what extent is that happening here? Or do you see that affecting your business or mission? Or what kind of pressure is that creating for you? Another way, how much is an issue for your team? Those are the questions where when you position insight, you're asking basically, hey, is it relevant to you? type of instrument question, risk and reward. Here having a customer do a little deeper thinking, asking them to weigh the potential drawbacks and the benefits with you. You must ask the question, what do you see is the potential risks and rewards of a strategy like that? Or what opportunities might this create for your company? Or risks does that pose for your organization? Or what could the downside of that for your organization? The goal is to create a dialogue, not an interrogation. I found that the more that you ask them for their opinion, their views, their thoughts, their strategies, their is, the more they are to listen to your ideas when you're positioned. Them. Those are several examples of enrichment questions. And other enrichment questions help you get to the root cause. On this picture, thought you might enjoy it. So after we've gone through the open shell of an insight, Site, and then the questioning funnel and to the answers. Then we summarize the issues and prioritize in order they want to address them if there's a list. You tend to elicit feedback like, how well you summarize your needs? Or how accurately have I stated your priorities? 
from there, you want to identify other stakeholders, if it's a larger organization, and then close out the meeting. So you might have a conversation. Who else should I be talking to? This is impacting. You want to get customers help in reaching that person. Nobody wants to be cold called anymore. So you secure the customer's help. Now, I found in working with many clients on large complex deals that there are folks or organizations who don't want to share, and they will try to block your access to other stakeholders. And they'll say, oh, you've got to go through me. Many happens with a procurement department. Well, it is not where deals are done. Their purchasing process Entire workshop just on dealing with procurement and negotiating. That's another uh, workshop on another day. But let's secure the customer's help in getting to all of the key stakeholders. Thank all their time. That's simple. So here are the three biggest mistakes people make in selling staffing services. One thing they're differentiating their brand is great service, when in fact it just sounds like every one else. So they have an outdated or inconsistent process. And three, they lack any of six crucial skills. So that being said, I'll turn it over. What do we do now? Well, it's need a day. No time like the present to learn a new approach a more consistent approach to say is just a lot of fun. So with that, here's my contact information. My tagline is that every great athlete has a personal development plan. Every great athlete has a coach. Who's yours? For now, Amanda, I'll turn it back to you and open the floor for questions. Great. If there's any questions, please go ahead and submit them using the chat feature. And also go ahead and open up a poll so you could give us your feedback. And time, Greg, do you have any um, other questions that you may have heard from other people that might be helpful to any of the participants today? Goodness. At the risk of overwhelming our audience, I hesitate to bring more. I think I counted uh, um, 30 some questions that I threw out in this one. I'll give you one here, Amanda, that is so powerful and deceptively simple that most sales reps overlook it. So I underwhelm you with this very powerful question. When you've finished your dialogue and asking questions and gotten your feedback, are you ready? Anything else that I should know? Now I heard that it was kind of like the air being let out of a balloon. That's it. Why well, did it? And the customer volunteered alphabet soup style everything else I should have asked and didn't. So the simple question, is there anything else that I should know? Is there anything I forgot to ask you? If you could yeah, dial it. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. It does look like I have any additional questions coming in at the moment. Thank you very much for your time today and for doing the second series on the three biggest mistakes. I know everyone's looking forward to the final conclusion of this series. Thanks for having me. And the next one is going to be around the six crucial skills that salespeople have to continue to polish and develop over their career if they're going to be effective. Oh, fantastic. Okay, well, I'd like to thank every everyone for their participation in today's webinar. Again, also thank you, Greg, for sharing his knowledge and expertise on selling staffing services. The recording of the webinar will be available on our website at www.tricom.com slash resources. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact either Greg or myself directly. Contact information is on your screen. 
again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session, which will be held in June around the healthcare um, updates. So with that, um, I will close everything out. And thanks again, Greg. I appreciate it. For having me, Amanda. Okay.